no, no, we're going straight in. No, 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 you know, no second chances. That's it. That's whatever, it. whatever comes out gets recorded. Is that it? Yeah. Essentially, yeah. We're not going to edit anything else out to it. So. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> So hello and welcome to what is our second video of the Elmhurst Discuss se video series. So my name's Dominic and I'm once again joined by our Technical and Operations Director Stuart Fairley and our Managing Director Martin Reed, who are better known as Stu and Marty. <laughs> <laughs> How are you both today? You good? I'm very, I'm very good, thanks Dom. We, 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 we had a rehearsal when we did the first shooting of, the, um, of, of our first discussion. And um, we found that rehearsal was better than the, li the, the, the live broadcast. So this time we're going to record it live at the rehearsal stage. There's no second cuts on this one. No, no, we're going straight in. No, 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 you know, no second chances. That's it. That's whatever, it. whatever comes out gets recorded. Is that it? Yeah. Essentially, yeah. We're not going to edit anything else out to it. So, uh. no. <laughs> um, so today's discussion, um, obviously we went quite broad last time. We were discussing about what does energy mean? But this time we're now focusing on the EPC or the Energy Performance Certificate, um, which is quite an interesting area. There's, a, there's been a lot of discussion about green recovery and uh, I think there's a lot of politicians advocating for putting in steps to improve energy efficiency, the housing stock, and obviously that's drawn a lot of attention to the, uh, the EPC, which is one of the outputs of a, sort of an assessing the energy efficiency of that stock. Um, so hopefully, I'm thinking today that the discussion around that will uh, maybe clear up some of the misunderstandings we have there and uh, might provide some more helpful information as well about the EPC. So uh, without further ado, let's begin. Don't swear, guys. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so question one is, uh, so I've seen a lot of people on social media around just criticising some aspects of the EPC. So um, what, why is this? Why do they, why do they criticise the EPC, do you think? Um, which, which, I, I don't mind starting on this. On. I, I, get, I get a bit frustrated, I think, is, the, is, the, is a nice word. I think actually most people who criticise it are genuinely interested. I think that's the first thing to say. They actually genuinely want to see how energy efficient their home is um, or their building, um, depending on what, what it is they're looking at. But I think what it is, is they focus on, and I, and I, I think you refer to it as the output, the EPC, um, and they'll criticise effectively the whole of the methodology, the whole of SAP or RESAP or ESPEN, whatever it necessarily is. And um, so I, I sort of think there's a bit of truth in there of what they're trying to get to, but they'll only focus on it. And I, I hear people say, for example, oh, my EPC isn't very good. And all they actually mean is the A to G sticker. Well, that's not an EPC and it's not the methodology. It's not the whole assessment. And, and so I guess that the, the point I think is, is people will focus on something that doesn't answer what they want to hear or that what they're interested in. And I take that as fair comment actually, because there's lots of information a calculation will do. Um, but, but fundamentally, as I said, they only see one thing and then obviously it gets criticized. And I think sometimes it's a bit unfair. I think that the, the methodologies can give it lots and lots of answers, but um, yeah, they, you, may, you may focus on one thing. Yeah, and we've got to be clear about what the EPC was originated for and, and, and some of the design remit originally, it, it, it's, it, particularly in the residential sector, it's a, it allows you across the whole of the UK to compare dissimilar houses in a, in a consistent way so that, that buyers can, can understand their relative energy performance. It doesn't necessarily relate to how the occupier will live, and I'm sure we'll come to that later. Um, I think it's, it's a shame. I suppose it's good that people criticise because at least they've read the EPC. I think maybe there is a bit of a lack of understanding of what an EPC is about, and maybe that purpose needs to be reviewed over time. Um, and I know we've got some ideas on that. Um, it, I do find it regrettable to think that even people within the industry who speak about energy efficiency, in a sense, want to criticise something which has, I think, so much value. At the end of the day, there's over 20 million EPCs now being issued on the central register. I predict probably over 50% of properties in the UK have an energy assessment. Um, those energy assessments are done at relatively low cost to the homeowner. 
um, and they give a good indication of the energy efficiency of that property. And I think that whilst we could all do better, I think we should pull together and say, okay, we've got what we've got, let's make it better, rather than suggesting that it's wrong and we need to get rid of it. Yeah, um, I was just, just picking up on that. And, and I think we discussed it in our last video for anybody that, that, that watched it is, is because if I'm focused on your word energy efficiency, it's the classic, isn't it? It's I'm interested in kilowatts of energy or I'm interested in the cost and fuel poverty would be very interested in how much it costs to run that home for people who haven't got very much money. Yeah. And then you've got the carbon element, how much carbon emissions is emitted. And for, for what we referred to last time, energy efficiency means so many things for different people. And actually what we all agree and every, everybody that you ever speak to, as Martin says, you know, even people with this knowledge, they all know that energy efficiency is something. And what we're saying is these methodologies will provide all of that information. And all we're talking about is, well, let's provide it all then. As, yeah. as you said, Martin, we talked and about it before. Yeah. How you present it, present it to them all back and let people make a really good choice. You know, whether it is a fuel price indicator that drives their behavior or, or it's uh, all about the carbon or actually they're yeah. all about the kilowatts of energy. And um, yeah, yeah, we talked about that last time. Yeah. Another factor, it probably won't come up later, but it's just as well about whenever you design anything, you've got to understand how much a market will be prepared to pay for it. And, and um, I'm sure that we could all make an energy performance certificate more accurate, closer to the truth, as we refer to in Elmhurst. Mm. But at what price would that come? Um, people will currently spend maybe £100 on an EPC for a residential dwelling, sometimes less. And um, it gives them a certain level of accuracy. They could spend two, three, four, five hundred pounds maybe on that. And it would get more accurate. Undoubtedly, the energy assessor would spend more time there. But at what point does the value of that increased accuracy stop and actually people would just reject it because it's too much of a cost burden? I think this cost value benefit needs to be sort of um, appreciated um, before we start criticising what I think is a fundamentally excellent resource of data um, in a document which certainly we need to improve. Yeah. So I think in the video last time, I think Stuart might have mentioned that we had the whole thing, this whole idea of food labelling, which I'll try and get edited into this video so you can see it on screen, um, which is sort of an example of what, what we could do to the EPC. Uh, has this been done before, like a, a new sort of format or way of showing the information on there? Uh, not, well, I think in the concept of having all of these metrics on displayed in an equal fashion, probably no, it's, it needs to be done in my opinion. Mm. Um, but when EPCs first started residentially in England and Wales anyway, they had two, um, two side by side, two, two, two grades, A to G stickers as I refer to, and one was on cost and one was on carbon. And then so many years later, they decided, they, so they decided, the government decided that it, it, they didn't like the carbon being alongside the cost one because it confused people because they got two different, you know, depending on what you chose and what was going on in your property. So it confused members of the public. So they stripped it back to one. Interesting, Scotland has both. So we are in a sort of a bit of a muddled state. Um, as I said, I don't think people get confused. Well, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but when you buy things at the shop and you see the sort of food labels, at least you presented all the facts. I think that's, I, I would say, that's what we need to do with energy performance. Present all the facts back to people and let people make their own choice. Um, and then at least we're not criticised that we're only shown one. And I think that's the big frustration. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I mean, energy efficiency in homes are complicated things. And, mm -hmm. and in an attempt to simplify it, maybe this sort of A to G cost rating is, is too much of an oversimplification. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and by being too simplistic, it has actually started to confuse people again. I think giving a balance of giving them enough information and clearly explaining what that information is about. As you say, the food labeling example where you see fat, sugar and salt clearly decla declared, um, the, the, the issue that they were having with that presumably was that they wanted to determine what healthy food meant. And of course, healthy food to somebody with high blood pressure is considerably different from healthy food for somebody with a weight problem. Um, and, and, and they do express it, and I think in a clear way. And I think relatively, um, um, you know, it, it could be, it, something very similar could be adopted for residential houses. Well, in fact, all buildings. Yeah, definitely. So would you say sort of at the moment, the whole format of the EPC sounds like it's a little bit muddled. Is, is there sort of a plan to change it in future? Yeah, that's the good news, really. So there's a couple of things going on. Um, most excitingly, in England and Wales, um, we've just announced to Elmhurst members this week, by the end of August, the whole um, EPC central register of England, Wales, Northern Ireland is going to be relocated. Um, it's been taken from the existing provider into what's called a .gov website, which means it's actually owned by government itself, not, not subcontracted out. Um, that's really exciting because that's a demonstration that government want to use this data. They want to have 
really understand it and make sure that they, they can uh, um, um, keep it clean and make sure that it's well presented and, 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 and really work with that data, which in itself is very exciting, we're very supportive of. Um, the other thing that they've also done, which is a really good advance, they've spent a lot of time working with consumers, trying to get consumers to say what they want from an EPC. And, um, and in that transition, tra transition, they have now come up with the first draft of a new format of EPC, which actually won't be a document at all. It is a portal. Um, and very similar if you've ever seen the, if you've ever checked your MOT online or your tax status on your car, a very user focused, lots of information and, and, and as much information as you really want. So it's very clearly described on the first screen, but as you start drilling down, you can get more and more data. Um, and the new EPC will look very similar to that, we believe. Um, there will be a printed version that is available, um, but that isn't a replacement for the EPC. That's just because they accept that there are some professions, maybe like the legal profession, that would like some sort of paper document. So there will be a paper document, but it, that won't be the EPC. The EPC will be referred to, will be the portal itself. Um, we've seen early drafts of it. Um, we, we have contributed to some of those discussions. Um, some of the improvements in our view haven't gone quite far as far as enough um, and I think MHE would do accept that this is their first attempt at, at, at taking it forward. Um, I personally have run a, a work group with our trade association where we've actually been pulling together lots of ideas for improvement um, and there's about 30 proposals are being made to MHCLG about what we think the EPC could and should look like some of the statements to, to clarify its use um, and they're very responsive to that and, and what they've said is that the current format of EPC being on a portal really lends itself to that improvement you know this isn't going to be a static document that it's going to be issued at the end of uh, late summer um, this will be a document that actually lives and grows and and, and we can f feed in those improvements to over a period of time so we're really excited and i think a lot of the, the issues that we've just been discussing about understanding of epcs will be addressed in that in that improvement can't wait for that then <laughs> when that comes available that, that's good that's good um i think I think the final thing really to say is that um, I know that fuel bills and costs seems to be quite a, a motive subject amongst homeowners. Uh, people have stated that the EPC doesn't really reflect what their own fuel bills are telling them each and every month. So uh, is, is this true? The criticism yeah. there? Yeah. Um, yes. I think fundamentally, yeah, Martin alluded to it earlier. He sort of said what EPCs were generated for, provided for first up was to be able to, for me to go and look at various houses if I was going to buy them or rent them and compare them. That was the idea. It's a miles per gallon standard running times. You know, we buy a car, this is the amount of miles per gallon it should do. This is the amount of energy that building should use. It's not about the people in it. It's so I could compare and look at this three bed semi and that that flat and on a similar level be able to understand on a standardized version absolutely perfect for what it needs to do that's great and what people then do is they grab hold of an epc and they look at this fuel bill which it predicts and that's mr and mrs average smith living in that property um and, and they say that's not my fuel bill after a little while you say no because it's an asset rating it's always was an asset rating it's about the asset the building with average people inside that um so we've been great advocators and every every time we ever respond in this space in terms of energy efficiency is when you start talking about people in buildings because what's the most important people in it living in it or working in it you need to do an occupancy model and all the occupancy model does it takes all that asset and that fabric and it says right now but you're going to use it like this and what temperatures what times you have your heating system on and then it will predict in a finer way what your fuel bill is likely to be and that's what we would always say that's what we need we need to break through that we need to allow our energy assessor the tools to be able to do that so that people won't criticize my epc for not being my fuel bill because they actually need these extra bits of information and yeah. we can help people inside buildings make good choices um, yeah just just to expand on what that what what this sort of standard occupancy refers to and um, what what the sat methodology does it assumes from a particular floor area how many people live in that dwelling so I remember checking one particular property, I think 140 square meters or something. Um, and it said that that was assumed that there will be five people living in that dwelling. Now, obviously those five people will then have a certain water usage demand. It would be assumed that that house is occupied by those five people in a normal way, which may well be that actually there's nobody in, in, occupant, in occupation between the hours of nine and five. Mm. Obviously, if that same house is then lived in by um, an elderly couple who are there 24 hours a day, 
the methodology cannot possibly have addressed their energy demand and it will be very very different and that's where the occupancy assessment comes in it tailors those standard occupancies which are mathematically derived to standardized properties across the country and actually focuses on that dwelling with that person or that those people in the in the, in, in occupation and the lifestyles that they that they perform um, the third dimension to this i think is really interesting and this is a lot's going to come from things like smart metering it's actually measuring the actual output now that doesn't mean that that we've always got to predict what energy consumption will be because when you when you to measure to measure energy performance you obviously you have to have the building there with people in it using energy to be able to measure it um, obviously every house at one time is a design and it's on paper so people have to design houses that they predict will consume a certain amount of energy and that's why the SAP methodology exists um, similarly, when you want to make a, a, an improvement to a property, if you're going to install a new measure, more insulation, new boiler, you want to predict how much energy you're going to save. So there'll always be a demand for methodologies that predict future energy consumption based upon some standard assumptions, and that will always exist. But once you've done that and you've got somebody living in there, to close the loop, you can start measuring performance and you can start feeding that measured performance back in and then you can start measuring the performance gap because if you compare the occupancy assessment result with the actual energy and if there's a difference that's the performance gap then you can start drilling down it doesn't tell you what the answer is but it tells you they've got a difference that you can start to eliminate now it might be that people do not live in the way we think they live it could be that the methodology is imprecise it could be that there's some other factor that we haven't yet considered but if you as um, uh, Stuart will say if you square the triangle you've got an asset occupation and measured performance you can actually have true understanding of where that performance goes but having measured performance on its own isn't the answer because then what you've got to do then you've got to make improvements and then it goes back around the loop to make better buildings and understand how, how people live in them so that's yeah. i think that, that that's what we're pushing for yeah Focusing i think three yeah i was going to say this 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 golden triangle i think it's yeah. been referred to as the three things and people who advocate and i'm all for it getting this metered data understanding how much you actually use in reality is fantastic but as i always say if you wanted to say well what am i going to do what where's what, what walls do i fix do i've got cavity walls or do i improve my boiler the metered data just says well i don't know i just know how much energy you're using yeah. so all three are absolutely brilliant bits of information asset occupation and metered data you just need to bring them all together and the problem is is the people on the other side if you like I'm only interested in this will criticize the current output which the only thing the only game in town at the moment is this asset and rightly they're saying that's not how much energy i use and we go we know so we're all in this together create the triangle give everybody the tools and as martin says is the old management phrase if i can't ma you know if i can't measure it i can't manage it and yeah. those three tools will allow everybody in the uk and i genuinely mean it to be able to manage what they're doing in their in their properties or their buildings and yeah and, and, we are, and we are so close to being able to deliver that. We could deliver that today, no problem yes, at all. Exactly. And, and that's, that's the leap we need to take. Absolutely. I think that is a, a very good conclusion. What, what I want to <laughs> add is a lot of what's been discussed here is, is actually within Elmhurst's new manifesto for growth, um, which I will put a link uh, in the YouTube uh, comments or description below. So you'll be able to check that out and just see what, what Martin Stewart are referring to, kind of set it all out quite clearly for you. But uh, I hope you've been, uh, enjoyed the video. It's probably longer than it was last time, but uh, these two are talkers, so can't really uh, say that they are the experts. They, they know what they're talking about. Uh, I'll vouch for them there. But um, please feel free to, to leave a comment or, or share the video. Uh, and we, Again, we welcome any, any feedback, or if you have any ideas about future videos, then please share them with us. We're, we're very keen to kind of continue with this. We'll probably get other people involved as well, so team leaders from Elmhurst, etc. Uh, and also just subscribe to the YouTube channel so you just know when they're coming up. So, But uh, thank you to you both. Thank you for setting aside some time in your busy schedules to join us today and uh, wish you well. And we hope to see you all very soon.